Good morning, everyone. My name is Johanna Argren Ross, uh, and as Dejan said, I founded Decenio magazine, and I'm also a curator at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to meet all thousand of you. Um, so this session is about mobili mobility, the road ahead. And we will be looking at the future of mobility in relation to cha the changing nature of the car and the changing nature of public transport, especially in urban areas. And with this session, we move into the panel discussions uh, of this uh, day's events. So to start off uh, and to set the scene for what we're going to be discussing, I'll offer you a quote that I hope you might all recognize. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches but I must make amends. In the opening line of one of Janis Joplin's most famous songs, she's invoking enlightenment through the purchase of a luxury German automobile. In her characteristically raspy voice, the American singer-songwriter pokes fun at a society obsessed with buying things uh, as a way of building self-worth and identity. While our attitude to consumption has altered very little in the 15 years since the song was first released, those symbols of that consumption has changed drastically. The car is no longer the same identity builder that it once was. Our vehicles are moving from individual possessions to service models shared by many. In dense cities, car ownership makes little sense. And with almost 50% of the world's 7.7 .7 billion inhabitants now living in cities, we are in need of workable alternatives. And yet, despite this growing population, cheap travel in London, for example, is flattening out, as increasing numbers of people choose other varieties of travel, travel from A to B. So ride-sharing apps, for example, or electric or non-electric bicycles and scooters. Uh, bicycles are now a status symbol in the same way cars and, uh, were at one point, and people invest in the same way that they used to or still do invest in cars. They spend several thousand pounds on the right bicycle or the right scooter. Meanwhile, to Uber is now a verb for transporting yourself across the city, whether you're using the app or not. At the same time, self-driving vehicles are entering the market. And the expectation of a vehicle's performance is changing significantly in line with this development. Speed or engine power might not be the criteria for how we actually choose our mode of transport in the future, but what level of entertainment system is on offer, or what conference callability the uh, mobility has, or indeed, indeed how physically fit it will make you, or how clean it will make the air. We have an excellent panel with us today to delve deeper into these questions and that work on this level every day and can share so much more than I can on this um, uh, topic. So, without little ado, I ask you to come to the stage. Klaus Busse, Head of Design at Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Fiat and Lancia, where he is shaping the car of the future. You can sit in that one, please. Yeah. Secondly, we have Philip Rode, uh, who is the executive director at LSE Cities at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And he focuses his research on sustainable urban development, transport and mobility, among other things. <laughs> Welcome. And then we have Professor Carlo Ratti from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he directs the MIT Sensible City Lab, which explores how new technologies are changing the way that we understand, design, and live in cities. Carlo, where are you? <laughs> Come on down. He was having a coffee the last time I saw him, so he'll join us eventually. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Hongshu, a president of Huawei a European Research Institute, who looks at how 5G will change how we communicate and will commute in the future. So, uh, Dr. Hongshu, please come to the stage. Thank you. We hope that Carla will join us eventually, but uh, to start things off, uh, I invite you, Klaus, to take over the podium.
Uh, this is quite an intimidating panel here. Uh, you guys clearly paid attention in math class, didn't you? Uh, math class was very important for me too, but more for this. Uh, this is where I started st uh, sketching cars back in the day. And, and I don't know, do you remember how your math teacher looked like? Me too, because I sketched him back in math class. <laughs> so I'm not a very good mathematician. I'm here more to speak about the emotional side about cars. Um, and when we talk about cars, we should first agree what a car is. A car is nothing else but one of many, many tools to get you from A to B. Last Sunday, I came back by plane from China. Yesterday, I came by train from Torino. This morning, I came by bus from the hotel. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a car guy, but that was the weapon of choice. Now, there are scenarios where I would always choose a car. These beautiful roads in Norway, for example. But there's other roads, other travels, where you might take a car, and they're not quite as spectacular as these roads. So what can I do? What can my team do? What can we designers do to make this travel from A to B a rich, beautiful experience? What can we do that even in this world of self-owned cars or partially owned cars or non-owned cars, that our cars are not just a commodity, but still an object of desire? For us, it all starts with the origin of our product. Now, this is Great Britain, obviously, clearly. And the British automotive industry embraces that. A British car is clearly identifiable as a British car. This would never be a German car or an Italian car or a French car. And the same is true, of course, for our friends from my home country in Germany, where it's very much about careful progression, stability and quality and the embrace of the machine. This vehicle here, and yes, we took out the Audi rings, but you know it's an Audi, they very much embrace the fact that this car does not want to look like it's been ever touched by the human hand. It's been designed by the computer, it's built by machines, and that is a very respectful approach to their brand message about quality and precision. Now, we in Turin, we embrace the Italian brand, the Italian nature, uh, culture and the Italian nation. You're on the left, you have a brand that I absolutely love, Alessi, which takes a simple object into something optimistic, something that puts a smile on your face. On the right, of course, we have Michelangelo. So it's a very warm culture about sculpture. And we have cars that represent both sides. On the left, you see our Fiat 120 embracing this optimistic Italian product design. On the right, the Alfa Romeo Tonale that embraces the beautiful uh, design of sculpture. Now, as Andrea is joining us here, you might wonder why a German can stand up here and speak about Italian design. As a matter of fact, the exterior designer of the Alfa Romeo Tonale is Greek. The interior designer, she's Russian. The head of the studio is American. So how can we have the authority to speak about Italian design? Well, as Andrea, as you can probably confirm this, there's not a single Italian espresso bean. We are like the espresso beans. We are the ingredients that come from around the world that help creating iconic Italian product, just like the espresso beans help creating an iconic Italian beverage. Because at the end of the day, it's the process that turns an international ingredient into something very Italian, as it is with the espresso, as it is with Italian design. So what is that Italian process? We very much still embrace the fact that our sculptors, the people working at Centro Stile, in a way are the ancestors of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. We embrace the human shape, the sculpture. And the reason for that is very simple. We believe that through evolution, our brain has been trained to embrace human shapes and consider human shapes as something positive, not negative, not threatening, like harsh angles. So when we design our cars, even though, yes, we have virtual reality, yes, we use the computer, milling, digitizing, everything. But at the end of the day, it's still the human hand, the human touch, that is the key to beautiful design here in Italy in the automobile industry. And the result, you might know, this is the Alfa Romeo Tonale. And it's not just about the beautiful sculpture of this car. It's also identifying the right elements that make your product instantly recognizable the Scudetto in the front, the phone dial wheels on the side. And because we have these iconic elements, everything in between can be pure, can be relaxed. So we can create attention, we avoid distraction. We can design desire. 
We also have some American brands in our portfolio, Fiat, Chrysler, and automobiles. And the same is true for our American brands. We very much embrace the fact that the, uh, the, the Jeep, in this case, is from America. And the key here is, I refuse to accept from my team any proposals when it came to color and trim from fashion, from the city, Gucci, Armani, etc. I wanted them to be inspired by what is rightful for Jeep, what is by nature. And, the, and one of the examples, just one I can give you quickly, we threw out chrome, we replaced it with warm colors, copper. Now this might sound old to you because we're in 2019 and now you see copper all over the industry in the cars. Back when we did it, inspired by nature, we were the first ones to do it. I'll give you another example of what we do with our American cars. Again, as, a, as an example of how to infuse passion, how to infuse soul. This is what we call Easter eggs. Easter eggs, we call these details that a salesman will not tell you about, that the commercial will not tell you about, and you might never discover them, discover them or you might, and they're there to put a smile on your face and to show the passion of the designer. On the left, this is what we call the dead pedal. That's where you rest your foot in the car. It could be any random pattern. Look at your car tonight when you drive home. Look at the pattern of that foot pedal if you have a car. In this case, we selected to turn into Morse code. And on the left, you see the name spelled out, sand, snow, rivers, rocks. So instead of a random pattern, it spells out these, these areas that are for Jeep. And then on the top right is a Chrysler product with a skyline of uh, Detroit embroidered into the uh, rubber mat where the car is built. And on the bottom right, you see the history of minivans in the, in the rubber mat of the Chrysler Pacifica. But let me move on to another area. This, these are things I've shown you so far we've done in the past and we will continue to do. Uh, the new challenge is this, the design and the information age, or I would pro uh, provocatively say design and the distraction age. Attention is a limited resource. We all have only a limited resource of attention. Right now, I am fighting for your attention and your phone is probably fighting also for the attention. So I'm competing with your phone about your attention. I think right now I'm doing pretty good, actually, what I can see here. <laughs> so that's good. But what can we do in cars to help you get through this day without distracting you? Because we're still pretty far away from self-driving cars. I hate to break it to you. Level 5 is still a few years away. There's prototypes. But before all of us are level driving level 5 cars, we still have to keep our eyes on the road. We still have to avoid distraction. So the story is not who has the biggest screen. The story is how to get you the relevant information. And we are making, we have made, made many mistakes in the automotive industry. We believed that every feature needs a button so you can show what you paid for. Even when we went to screens, we made the same mistake. We put absolutely every information onto that screen and not only the relevant screen, uh, information. So no matter what the input device was, whether it was touch on the button, whether it was the screen, or now today voice, we have a challenge ahead where we can do much better in the automotive industry. And that is to go from the crowded, overloaded information to a curated experience, to something where the information is pre-selected, timely, and only relevant for the moment you need them. We designers have to be information curators. We have to be storytellers, the Easter eggs. We have to be sculptors, create a beautiful shape, and an, an attractive shape. We have to be craftsmen without quality, without embracing the team and the engineering part, our, pro our projects will fail. Yes, we have to be visionaries. We have to understand what is going on in the society. Because above all, to make a car still be relevant in the future, the self-owned car, we have to create an experience because we believe the experiences will last beyond the product. Thank you very much. Peter, next. Philip, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin by thanking Altigama and Dan Sujic for allowing me to speak to an audience I've never spoken to in my life. Usually I speak to policymakers, to students, to people in environmental and city 
urban contexts. It's absolutely incredible for me to have you listening to me, and I hope uh, you, you will also uh, listen to me for those 15 minutes. Now, I'm going to take this theme of mobility, to which we have already heard, one level up. And I'll make the case that it's the city that is the ultimate accessibility machine, the machine that provides us with what we actually want. And what we want is access to each other, access to goods and services, and maybe most importantly, access to inspiration and ideas. But when we talk about the city, we often talk about the city as a static object, and we forget that it's made of moving parts as much as it is made of of static objects. And I will go on and argue that it's these moving parts, and this is of course code also for the automobile, that are ultimately making or breaking cities. So let me take you first on a very quick journey how transport systems, technological innovations, and the city have always been co-produced. This is a photo, or in fact a drawing, of Victorian London, the 19th century. And it reminds us of the combination of the terrace house in the foreground, which would have been impossible without the little steam train in the background. It was the first time that the city could expand horizontally as a result of mobility provided on a daily basis over greater distances. And the next industrial revolution became even better at creating urbanity. This is a scene from Broadway in New York City. It's the electrification of our cities. Electric trams, but maybe more importantly, electric elevators for the first time allowing us to go vertical beyond eight stories. It created an enormous amount of urban life compressed into confined spaces in places like New York and Berlin at the time. And then post-war came another revolution which transformed our cities for good. It's of course the motor car with its infrastructure, in this case Los Angeles, a big highway intersection. And it dispersed human activities in urban territories beyond what we had ever seen and witnessed before. And some would argue that this is the moment when no longer it's the city which we're seeing here, but some form of urban agglomeration that has actually gotten rid of a lot of urbanity and the kind of associations we have with city life. So keep that in mind. It's the combination of our transport systems with urban life that is so much connected that we must not make the mistake in the future of disrespecting that connection again. Why? Because we have created endless cities. This is the periphery of Mexico City, a very dispersed urban territory and landscape where in this particular neighborhood, humans on average commute to their jobs and schools and services between three, two and three hours, one direction per day. It's the result of the proposition of the dispersed urban agglomeration. And at the same time, the economy has remained fairly compressed in specific locations of cities. What you're seeing here is the workplace density of London, New York and Hong Kong. These cities have fairly comparable urban economies of the service sectors, of, of course, the financial sectors, and increasingly the tech industry. And they have one thing in common. They want people to be compressed as much as possible into finite spaces. That's where we get the creativity going, and that's where we get the information flow we need in cities. 150, 200,000 people per square kilometer, you do see here in those peaks. And this is not the density on the floor space within an office, it's the density of a neighborhood where the street, the pub, the cafe is as much part of the economic equation as it is the internal workplace density. If you access these densities our economy needs and our global productivity has celebrated with privately owned vehicles, you of course get congestion. And there is no city in the world that has solved the crisis of congestion. What you're seeing here is an image of Beijing which possibly most radically tried to really embrace the building of highway infrastructures to get around that conundrum, and it failed miserably. And it's now paying the cost of maybe even up to 15% of GDP 
as a result of car use in its cities. That's not just congestion, it's of course related to a few more major failings of the current urban transport systems in the world. And you know all of them, because these are all headline issues and concerns in the news. And still, those statistics are shocking. This is only road traffic. And producing about 50% of the air pollution in the world, which in total results in more than 4 million deaths. Traffic crashes. Again, in urban areas, about half this figure uh, is related to uh, what's happening in cities. It's 1.3 million deaths per year. And it's the leading cause of death amongst young people between the age of 5 and 29 globally. And there's obesity and there are also the communities which are often destroyed by our current way of moving about. And of course this morning we heard about the ultimate crisis, the ultimate challenge. You will be aware uh, of this beautiful illustration of our global climate crisis in bands per year the average temperature increases from 8050 to 2018. This is very real and we can't deny it any longer, both in terms of its human inducedness and its reality. The sad story is that urban transport plays a central role in this equation. It's only about 23% of global carbon emission that are transport related, but the dynamic trends in transport are the most worrying amongst all sectors. If we keep transportation systems going as they did, we will be doubling emissions by 2050. And at the moment, of about 10 billion trips in cities uh, per uh, day worldwide, they are increasingly motorized. And not only that, even in countries where we have thought we would have solved the carbon emission equation in transport, we're seeing very worrying trends. What you're seeing here over time from uh, 19... 90 to 2017 are the carbon emissions for all major US cities in transportation. You're seeing the effect of design here. Number one, the difference between a place like New York and Dallas. New York, of course, being far more carbon efficient because of its urban form, allowing people to walk and cycle, take public transport. But there's a second design story, design-induced result in these emissions. And this is the most recent increase we are seeing entirely unpredicted by anyone, and only two weeks ago explored by the International Energy Agency. They were stunned to see this kind of increase. And guess what they found? That's the reason. Sport utility vehicles, the second most important contributor to the increase in carbon emissions globally, is the reason why we're seeing those trends reversing. Our shift from lighter, older vehicles to heavy two, three-ton vehicles is a global concern. Let me end by speculating about the future. As we look forward at a conference which talks about next, what is next, I want to raise, I think, in a polemic way, two major alternatives when we come to this ecosystem of the city and it moving, its moving parts. And the first question we need to ask is whether we are again prioritizing fixed ideas of vehicle and car design, where the starting point of our mobility design is indeed the vehicle itself. To then have privately owned vehicles that in the end will be used for less than 3% of the time. And we know the landscapes in urban areas this kind of logic is producing. Do we want to again designed for high speed, but move mostly in congested, slow-moving traffic over short distances. Is this really a machine for the city and an urban age? Do we want to design again for five seats, but only essentially move one passenger for most of the time? And whether that's electric or hybrid, if it takes amount, this amount of space, it does not matter, it does destroy the urban accessibility equation. So are we again, after almost a hundred years where we introduced the private vehicle to our cities, redesigning simply the 20th century car and just have it electric and autonomous? An idea which, by the way, has been around for some time and is now, of course, being embraced increasingly. 
Well, urban transport planners and politicians know that this equation is not helping cities, whether it's the conventional, the electric, or indeed the autonomous car, the traffic jam will look the same. And are we again really trying to then adjust urban space and infrastructure to that one machine? It seems some people think so. This is a concept designed by the boring company, by Tesla. A huge tun tunneling operation proposed underneath the skin of Los Angeles. And London designers and architectural firm is taking that even further, really thinking through, preventing to rethink the vehicle, but structure everything around it. Or instead, and this is of course the other polemic, can vehicle design make cities better and more accessible? Can we really take seriously the opportunity we now have at hand, literally, with our mobile phones and the mobile internet in terms of making our cities accessible? Rethink the traditional separation of what is public transport and private transport, for example, as the Berlin Public Transport Authority is doing with this flexible digital bus, which, by the way, would allow us to revolutionize the many very, very innovative mini taxi operators you will find in many cities around the world which are less affluent than our European cities. This happens to be Kampala. We have seen the seeds of the opportunity planted in bike sharing. We are now seeing the opportunity of electrifying shared bikes and e-scooters. These seem to be real opportunities and game changers. And next year, we will witness the Olympic Games in Tokyo, where some of the athletes will be moved by the first autonomous vehicles, taxis in this case, in Tokyo, and hopefully learn the first lessons. And maybe most importantly, can we please re-understand that what we, what we are moving on the right side in an image like this, in a conventional urban motorway, may be just about 2,000 people per hour in direction, whereas this bus and the bus lanes move 40,000 people per hour in direction. If we do not understand and appreciate this as designers, we are failing the city. So what's happening in contained spaces of manufacturing of the moving parts for our cities is urban design. And I really urge all people involved in designing vehicles to think about their primary operational space, which will be ultimately urban and in urban territories. That will be absolutely central. And from my perspective, as an urban person, I would argue that the test of whether you got your design right or wrong is whether it helps to create an urban street we would appreciate, an urban street we would like to visit and enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, Good morning, good morning, everybody. Could we see the slides? Yes. So I thought, you know, that as we are looking at this and, you know, the conference called Next, I want to show you how people thought about Next a long time ago. And there's actually a bunch of French designers uh, imagining around 100 years ago how life would be en l'an 2000, in the year 2000. At the time, they got some things, oops, they got some things uh, uh, right. They saw mechanization in agriculture coming, as you see it here. Um, they also saw Roomba appearing somehow, you know, uh, in our in our homes. But they also got a lot of things wrong about transportation. And you see here, they thought actually that uh, aviation police would be moving like this in our cities, that actually would uh, cross the oceans like this, and actually that, uh, you know, firemen would, uh, would act like this. And so the bottom line here is that uh, as we are thinking about next, about what's coming next, is that it's impossible to predict the future. And actually, if you look at this, that's Karl Popper, you know, he, he stated in a very eloquent way, philosophically, you know, because the future is what maybe, it's based on some of the ideas that maybe some of you will have today at the conference. And those things might trickle down and change tomorrow's world. So we cannot predict it. But what we can do is actually play with today and try to change it. And that's really what design is about. I think to me the best definition of design is how design can help us to change today's situation into perhaps a slightly better future. 
And that's what we're doing. We're doing with our uh, design office in uh, New York, in Turin, in Singapore. I'm not going to talk much about the work we do there with Caloretti Associati. Uh, we are very proud to be designing the Italian pavilion at the World Expo in Dubai. And, uh, but I will not tell you about the architecture today. With our um, research operation at MIT, that's uh, both at MIT in Boston and Singapore, and some of the startups actually came out of them. And actually, super pedestrian that you see there, we'll not talk about that, but is one today is the number three player in the United States in micromobility that Philip just talked about, about scooter, scooters and d bike It's a company we started, uh, we funded with venture capital, and it's now uh, been, become one of the big players in the space. But today I want to tell you about data. Today we can see a city like this. We couldn't a few years ago. When you look at this, this is Lisbon. It's map using billions of data points collected from the taxi network. This visualization was a moment the Museum of Modern Art in New York was done by Pedro Cruz from Amalabi at MIT. But if you take this data, you can do interesting things. The same data in New York shows you this, that's taxis in New York, pickups and drop-offs. By the way, which place is this in New York? Yes, JFK. You know, this JFK airport, you probably landed there. If you zoom out, you see JFK down there. You see Manhattan and all of the boroughs. And then here we use mathematics to ask ourselves how many trips could be shared in New York. And if you look at those two points in Manhattan, you've got hundreds of thousands of trips connecting them in the course of the year. So how many of them could be shared? Well, when you want to look at that, analyze the city like this, you need to use design and a lot of mathematics. It's still a design question. How could we change transportation system. And here you see the mathematical papers. If some of you are interested, they're on our website. We use network science to do it, teaming up with the mathematics team at Cornell University. And what we discover is interesting, that in Manhattan, we could take everybody to destination when they need to be there, exactly when they need to be, be there, give or take one, two, or three minutes, but with 40% less vehicles than what we have today. Now, the first results came out a few years ago, and they came to the attention of Uber, we started a collaboration between our team at Uber, and as you might know, Uber Pool today does exactly that. Allows two people going more or less in the same direction to share the ride, which means one less car on the road, which means less congestion, less consumption, and uh, less pollution in, in our cities. Um, the same thing actually we're applying now to transportation. I think this is something quite absurd that's happening in our cities. You know, five years ago in the United States, I would actually go to shop at Whole Foods uh, twice a week, and when I wear it Whole Foods, I would also buy a few things, other things. Today, I got four deliveries a day of this stuff coming to my home. Certainly not sustainable. And again, we can use mathematics to analyze the city and see how we can think about a better system. And the system that doesn't destroy the richness of our cities. Uh, the mayor of Paris was telling me a few weeks ago, I mean, should we let Amazon or whatever e-commerce take over? What, what would happen to Paris? The beauty of Paris is the richness of commerce in the streets. We cannot lose that, and we showed before in Philip's beautiful presentation. Now, so all of this, I think, you know, requires a better understanding of the city. That's a scientific paper we had in Nature just a few months ago. In this case, we asked a slightly different question, which is, what is then the minimum number of vehicles we need to keep Manhattan on the move? And here's a short video. If you can actually have the volume a little bit. So that's real, da that's, um, real data in Manhattan. That's the situation today, actually. And um, now again, if you analyze it, you, um, you can try to develop new ways to, uh, to, to uh, optimize mobility. So what you see here is actually situation today. You see it in a moment, one side. But how things could be cut tomorrow. So again, using big data in order to understand the city and then hopefully optimize it. So what you see here to the right is actually today's situation in Manhattan and to the left is actually uh, what we could do just by looking at this, the city is a dynamic system that could be, could be optimized. Again, a lot of mathematics, as I said, you know, this uh, 
uh, was published in Nature is now becoming a new company. We're spinning off, but that's for me a design question. It's about seeing how we can actually understand the system, in this case Manhattan, in this case mobility in cities in general, and how we can make it better. Now, thinking about cutting the number of vehicles, I'm just hearing here a message that my time must be cut from 15 minutes to five because we are running late. So I'm happy actually to start to wrap up. I wanted to just share with you a few other quick things. Is that okay? Two more minutes or should yes. I cut? Well, if you, if, we can, if you can slowly move towards the end, that would be good. Or quickly move towards the end. Yeah, I, you got two, two, two solutions. I mean, you need to tell me. I mean, one is that I, I run my, my slides for 15 minutes in five, and I speak three times as fast. Uh, or the other thing is actually just, you know, show a couple of things, and then we, we talk in the discussion later. But I want to show one small thing, actually, about data as well. And again, it's a design problem. And the problem is related to how we can use the car to better understand infrastructure. And I wanted to show this in Italy, because you might remember the collapse of a famous bridge in Italy a little over a year ago. As a collapse of this bridge, which is the Tacoma Bridge, that collapsed in the United States uh, a few decades ago. And so what we've been doing is actually using data coming from the road infrastructure to monitor what is going on and understand better how we could avoid that what happened in Genoa last year would happen again. And so I'll show you here, that's an example from the United States next to MIT is one of the bridges that again was about to collapse. We started studying the Golden Gate in, uh, in San Francisco. Today you monitor it like this with fixed sensors and you get this information. But we said, you know, what about using now the data we collect in our pockets. Again, data is the key thing. Data we collect in our phones, in our cars. And so we, we went to the Golden Gate because it's a bridge that's very well known. And we started collecting all this information, going back and forth a hundred times. That's why you want to have a lot of graduate students working with you. After a hundred times, they were actually stopped by the San Francisco police. They got a bit puzzled. And then from that, actually realized that through this information, that's the raw data you get, we can actually monitor the city in a much better way. So you want to retain just one message and stop it here. Uh, we can talk about the other projects in the discussion. But just one message is that data today allows us to better understand the city. We absolutely need, if you want to design mathematics, big data, knowledge of that in order to make sense of the environment and see, going back to the initial point, the Karl Popper quote, how we can use this to, to turn today's condition into a future, hopefully better one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we are in fact being given messages that we have to cut the questions completely, but Dr. Hong Shui, I was hoping that maybe you could answer some of what uh, Carlo just spoke about in terms of what happens in real time within the Huawei uh, European Research Institute in terms of the data that you work with and how does your work influence the way that we will look at mobility in future. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to share with my idea from ICT technology point of view. You know, Huawei uh, is an ICT company that uh, provides products and solutions major for communication networks, for uh, consumer business, cloud AI, and also car ICT. During the past 30 years, we have seen a rapid increase in the ICT industry. Uh, based on the estimation given by GSMA, you know, um, the global data service will increase about 180 times within 10 years. So for Huawei, our vision is to bring digital to every person, home, organization, to enable a fully connected and intelligent world. So in Europe, uh, I'm responsible for establishing new R&D centers and joint labs so as we can work together with telecom operators, work together with universities, industry partners, and uh, um, standard organizations in order to provide better service and create new solutions for the future. Um, we hope uh, we can 
invest more uh, in technologies like 5G, 6G, and the next generation optical communication. Invest for advanced AI and cloud computing, and invest for sensor, camera, IoT, and AR, VR solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am afraid that we actually have to cut it there. We can't do the conversation that we planned. So we will have to say thank you to all of you in the panel for sharing some of your insights into what the future of mobility might look like. I think that we can take away from that that there are exciting times ahead and there is interesting opportunities and possibilities, both within car design, the way that we uh, design the infrastructure for our cities, and the way that we capture and collect that data to help us build better environments that we all want to live in. So um, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we will continue on to the next panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>